Hi right, guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Tonight's session, five or maybe more frustrating things about astrophotography. And it's going to be presented by Sean Maloney tonight. Um, but uh, before we go into that, uh, I do want to show off our image of the week. Let's see if I can do this via the window. Yes, I believe I can. Um, uh, this week's image of the week goes to Bruce Bronstein for his Iris Nebula, which comes to remind me, I guess it's Iris Nebula season, uh, but a beautiful uh, wide field target uh, with an AT65 EDQ. And uh, then, of course, uh, CCD camera, and uh, I have to say, uh, yeah, LRGB uh, from the Stellar View Star Party. So uh, looks like he got to some nice dark skies and showed off a lot of that dark dust. Uh, as always, uh, you know, you can, I'm on the website here, I think you see it. Uh, you can submit your images of the week by hovering over image of the week there and clicking that image of the week submission. And when you do that, you will see image of the week submission, scan down to the bottom, and then that's where you do it. Type in your name, the object's name, a little description of what you did, and click send and I should get it. Oh yeah, upload the picture too. Uh, that's basically it. Um, let me, how do I figure out how to get that screen back? There we go. Um, okay, so uh, basically that's all I got. Uh, I'm going to hand it right over to Sean, who can uh, go into the presentation. There you go, Sean. We see you. Who we got going here? Share. Let's see. <laughs> can you see it, Adam? Yep. You there? Yes. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, I hear you. And I see you. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Uh, how you doing? I'm Sean Maloney down in uh, Baton Rouge, and uh, my website's there, Red Stick. Everybody keeps asking me what Red Stick is, so real quick, I'll tell you. Um, when the French came over, they would uh, they found these trees with red lines on them down here in Louisiana. So they, it's French for uh, Baton Rouge. So. Down here we call Baton Rouge Red Stick because it just it's backwards, but it's stick red. But uh, that's where I kind of stole the name, and because I live in Baton Rouge, so that's what it means. If anybody's interested, probably the most interesting thing I'll, I'll talk about. Um, anyway, uh, tonight I want to talk about the. Um, let's see here. Hang on a second. My. Uh, hang on one second. I'm having a little trouble here. You see my screen there, Adam? I'm sorry. No problem. Right now I see the Google Hangouts uh, room. Yeah, I'm trying to. Why is it do it showing me that? Try. I don't know if you're sharing full screen. When you click the screen share, uh, your entire screen, just make sure that's hovered. Click share. Uh, yeah, that's your whole desktop. I just lost you, I think. I think we're still, are we, you still hear me? Still hear me? Still hear me? Can you hear me, Adam? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I don't hear anybody. How about now? I can still hear you. Can you hear me? Guys in the room, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah, I can, can hear you fine. I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. All right. But, Sean, you still can't hear me? There you go. Try, try at the bottom one. Oh, you can't hear me. You know, Sean, that's, that's a really good introduction to a presentation about frustrations of astroimaging. <laughs> Yeah, 
in the meantime, oh, did he totally pop off? In yeah. the meantime, in, in the meantime, can I tell him about uh, Warren coming out to um, where's Warren coming out to GMARS in September? Warren, right Warren Keller is going to be coming out to Goat Mountain Astronomical Research Station, which is a, the dark sky site for the Riverside Astronomical Society. You know who Warren Keller is, everybody. Warren is um, uh, he's written the, the program about um, uh, uh, yeah, picks inside. He's written the big book about it. He didn't write the program. He wrote the book about it, and he's the one that finally explained everything and how it goes and how it works and stuff like that. Uh, Woodland Hills is sponsoring a program where um, Woodland Hills is going to have him come out and uh, uh, do some live uh, recordings of processing tutorials and things like that. And so we suggested that he comes out to GMARS and anybody who wants to come out and do some camping with them. Um, and uh, starting Thursday, Friday night, have a couple of days of camping. And then on Saturday all day, you get a workshop with Warren Keller, do some more astroimaging. And uh, that's kind of fun thing. It costs 50 bucks. Go over to Woodland Hills. And um, uh, there's a link on the website. You can register for it. And that's that. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. We've got some, right. some jokes here. Sean, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. I hope oh, for a second I saw the right screen. Yeah, I, I don't know why it's not. Now I see you. There. Now I see me. Um, let me see. Make sure that when you're sharing your screen, you're trying to. There you go. I see the right screen now. Yeah, let's see something. Yeah, can you just run. We can can see you just run your PowerPoint. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Let me. Uh, I think I know what's wrong over here. I got two screens, and it, it doesn't know which one to share with. So let me disconnect this other one and just share my one screen. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, okay. we did test this out last here. week. Okay, what y'all got now? We got uh, your PowerPoint screen. Yep. We see it. But now we see the Hangouts window. So we see, I think, whatever you're seeing. So you're not going to be able to see the Hangouts window. You're only going to see your PowerPoint, I think. I don't know what's wrong, guys. Can, can you go back to your PowerPoint screen and just run your PowerPoint, or will it not run? Share. That's it. Change slides. Change your next slides. There we go. Yep. There you go. It's working. Seems to be working now. There you go. All I gotta do is. I I don't know. I I think you just have to do exactly what you're doing earlier. But once you click back to the Hangout screen, we see what you're seeing. I can't I can't hear anybody. Oh, you can't hear us? Hmm. I have no idea what's going on. So, speaking of frustrations in astrophotography, frustrations in technology all the time. Um, let's see if we can get this. Okay. You guys there? Yep. Okay. I I got going now. Hang tight. Sorry about that, guys. All right. Can you see all this? I'm not see. Uh, no, not yet. Oh, oh, wait. I got a screen share. Hang on. And then what? Screen share? Screen share. Share. Now I see Hangouts. Now I see your PowerPoint. Okay. Slideshow from the beginning. 
Now we're good. We're there? So okay. Just, Sorry, guys. No problem. Hopefully, uh, it'll work better than the, the presentation will be better than my handling of this computer. All right. Well, anyway, this is a uh, – there's a lot of beginners. Uh, first of all, let me just start by saying that, you know, this is about – People trying to get started outside shooting after you've kind of gotten your stuff and, and you're struggling to figure out how to make all this stuff work. And, you know, by no means what I'm going to show you here is the way to do it. It's just the way I did it. And then there's I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I'm hoping that maybe by going through this, that if you're new and you, you're watching this for the first time or it's, you know, it's down the road and you found this, that this is a, this is going to be a presentation for you. So, um, my target audience is uh, it's not so much the people that are looking to buy equipment or maybe think about getting into astrophotography. The audience is for people that are committed, driven people that have decided, like I did months ago, that you know I'm going to learn this. This is what I want to do. I want to. I'm going to spend the money. I'm going to spend the time. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. To learn this um, it's also like I said earlier for people who have pretty much by and large bought their own gear kind of like I am in this little picture over here you know just starting out in my first couple of weeks um, and you're trying to image and and you can't get PhD running you can't get your uh, program that whatever camera you got hooked up you can't get that running you, you know all these pieces and parts have to come together and you can't even get it going and you got a million questions and you're just hungering for help. So that's that's who my my audience is and so in order for me to to, to do this presentation, it's probably a good idea for me to kind of give you a little perspective of, of who I am. I kind of blew in the scene here about a month ago, but I've been here for a while uh, watching and watching all these videos and, and keeping up and learning things. But I want you to know where I was so you can be comfortable about being there too. So and I'm just going to spend a couple minutes telling you my little quick story. And when I started out, Adam, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, let me know if any questions or anything come up. But the uh, December 20th of last year is when I bought my first scope. Now, my first real scope, which was the uh, – the ED-102, which you see over here on the right. Um, I bought this first one, which was a Star Seeker, and, and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm ready to go, man. I'm going to go shoot pictures. Well, it, you know, we all know what happened there. It was shaking and violent and trying to put a DSLR on it. That was crazy. I didn't know what I was doing. So then I found a, a deal where I could buy this AVX mount, and uh, let's see if I get a little pointer going. Yeah, so I could buy this little – AVX mount with a Newtonian Celestron uh, eight inch, and I thought, now I'm there. I'm good. I got a good mount. Well, that lasted a, a, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so. And same thing, it was shaking all over the place. And it's probably a decent scope for imaging, but it it wasn't for me as a beginner. That's for certain. So on December twentieth, I joined a group, and. Uh, they were kind of leading me to realize that I needed to buy a better scope. So they told me to get the refractor, which I did. And then they were also telling me that this AVX mount was probably not going to be what I wanted but for what I wanted to get to, which we'll talk about in a minute. But so what I originally did was I put this, the CD 102 on that AVX mount. And then I just started posting questions and trying to figure my way through it all. So then where I am today, which has been the first two months of the time, I was pretty much floundering. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I couldn't find anybody to talk to. Um, so really, I got about four months under my belt. And in that time now, I'm, I'm fully integrated. I'm working with uh, SG Pro. Uh, don't have a rotator, but pretty much everything else is one click, and I'm finished. Um, I've, I'm still on the ED-102. Uh, I'm I'm sitting on an NDQ6 mount that I was uh, led to buy, which has been a wonderful mount. And I also have this uh, C11 that I use for both sides. Uh, I've got a Hyperstar that puts on the front, and I can image out the back of it. Um, but in four months, I went from not really knowing anything with this stuff, and now I'm sitting on this in four months. And 
you know, like I said, everybody's going to be different, but I was really driven. I really want to learn and, and I, I still do. And I, I feel like I'm really just getting started. And that's because of, of all the, the trouble I had trying to get going and, and, um, which is what brings us to this presentation. So, so what, so what do we do? So you got your gear and you're, you're, you're going out in your backyard and you know, you're trying to figure out what to do. The first thing you really want to do is you want to set a goal. Okay. You want to know where you're going, what's your plan, what do you want to achieve, where do you picture yourself in a year or two, and, and write that down. Um, you know, it's, it's like a business plan. It's a living document. You're going to go back to it. But the reason I tell you to do this as a beginner is because we, we have a tendency in this field, at least I did, and I think I've seen it in a lot of other people, that you'll, you'll buy things without even really doing the research to know if it's going to be there in a six months to a year for you or, but if you write down your goal and you know, this is, this is where I want to be. This is, this is what I want to do. And, and then you have that, you have that as a reference point and you go back to it as much as possible. Anytime you make a decision to buy a piece of equipment or do anything, you want to keep that in mind. Um, <coughs> And then you're going to choose your path of how you're going to get to that goal, okay? Um, you can jump in the deep end like I did and just, you know, try to get everything at once, or you can jump in the shallow end and swim your way up. Either way, you're going to probably get to where you're trying to get to, but each path brings its own problems. But one of the things to warn you about is that, uh, you know, people are going to tell you that you can't do something and why you should wait. Uh, I got told that a lot, you know, well, you just need to, to shoot with a DSLR and you need to do that for a year and you need to stay on this program. And, and, you know, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I wanted to move forward. I wanted to, to, to use what everybody else was using. I, I can learn it. You can learn it. Um, so don't let, don't be led by others. Um, you know, like if I read a million times, pigs and sites too hard, don't, don't get on picks and site. Don't do that. Do this for a year or so, and then you can go learn picks and site. Well, my philosophy was, well, if I'm going to learn picks and site in a year from now, why should I spend all my time learning these other software programs? And why not just go through it now and learn it from the beginning, which is what I did. And I'm by no means an expert at picks and site, that's for sure. But coupled with Photoshop, I find it to be, you know, it's, I see where it's going to take me eventually one day. But I'm glad I'm learning it now, and I'm glad I'm not waiting a year to go and learn that because I mean, that, it would almost be like starting over, I would think, for me. And uh, we were talking before this. It's The learning curve is kind of – there's so many working parts in astrophotography that I kind of – I always looked at it now as that there's two learning curves. There's the learning curve of, okay, how do I set up? PhD. What what numbers do I put in these boxes? What you know? What drivers do I need? What? How do I get this thing turned on? How do I get it up and running? What's this graph all about? How's that work? Um, I got to learn software. I got to learn hardware. I got to learn how to polar align. I got to learn uh, to star align and all these different things. You know, all these working parts and. I found it very frustrating, and I kept telling people that I finally got to talk to us. I said, you know, I, I hate this part. I, I want to learn. I don't mind making all the mistakes and learning from my mistakes. Um, and once I know how to, but at least just getting up and running and, and actually getting some data. And it's frustrating when you're first starting out and you're in your backyard and you just want to shoot a picture or something, but you can't even get your, your gear running, much less, and you don't know who to turn to to ask questions of it. Um, so getting out of that starting gate it is always hard for those for those people that are in that that portion of the, the learning curve. Um, and part of this presentation is I want you to know as a beginner what's waiting for you down the road so that you don't buy stuff that you don't need. Um, 
and I always laughed. I, everybody calls it a hobby. I don't find it to be a hobby. I think you deserve an associate's degree after you get to a point where you're actually out there, like some of these guys in this room. I mean, you got to learn a lot of stuff, building birdhouses, collecting stamps. You know, I'm, I know I'm being a little facetious to kind of joke around here, but this is a tough thing. And, 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 and astrophotographers are, are, are smart people. Um, you, you have to learn some pretty good science and, and you have to have some pretty good mechanical skills and you have to be able to be adept to learning software. And, um, you know, I guess you could call it a hobby, but I think it's more than a hobby. I find it, it is an art form, but it's also a very structured, detailed. I mean, I, had to, I have to go to school to learn to do this. Um, and it, it's, uh, you know, long hours of imaging. And like I said earlier, learning those multiple software programs. So that leads me to your first time when you're going out. Okay. You got to deal with the fear. Um, I'm sure some of the guys in here that have been doing it a long time, if they remember back, I, you, you, you start and you buy your gear and, and you, you're afraid to go out. You're afraid to, to go try it because you don't want to fail. You know, you don't, you just, you're nervous about it. You think, Oh, I need to get another piece of equipment or I need something else. No, you need to go out and you need to set it up and you need to try and uh, you're going to make mistakes. But what I did was I kept a ledger and uh, I brought it out with me every time I went out and, and I would write down my questions. I would write down uh, thoughts that I had about it. And, and to this day, I still bring out a ledger with me every night and keep track of what's going on so that I can ask those questions the next day or even go study on something because you won't remember it all because it's very overwhelming at first when you're just trying to get up and run it. And then I have something that I like to call the wall, which is uh, I'm going to get into a little bit later. But this astrophotography is definitely not something you find in the yellow pages in your phone book. It's not something you're going to find, luckily, if someone even in your town is doing it. And so as a beginner, you're outside and you're like I said, you're trying to do all these things and you don't have any place to go and uh, you don't know who to ask. And, and a lot of it is just fly by the seat of your pants and try to just figure it out. And, and like the guys in the room were talking to me before, that's pretty much what everybody does. And um, hopefully there'll be something in here that'll come along that maybe it, when you're starting out that you might get something out of it that'll save you from some of the hassles that I went through and so maybe some of the other guys went through. All right, so let's let's kind of just talk about buying and selecting gear. And uh, Adam, just stop me if there's any questions. I don't imagine there's too many at this point. Um, but parts, okay. So remember, I said to set a goal, to to write it down and know where you're going, okay. And you need to ask yourself, is this part, you know, will it assist me on achieving that goal? And if so, for how long? And I like to say, does this part have an expiration date? And if it does, if, if you're only going to use it for a month and then you're going to upgrade, uh, or can it be accomplished without that part? Uh, and will it upgrade with me? If, if any of those answers are no, you know, then, then you really need to consider about not buying that part and maybe waiting it out or, or seeing, you know, you want to, you want to be deep space astrophotographer producing these gorgeous images and, and we all get caught up in, I, I need that next part. You know, that's going to make my, my thing so much better. And what you'll end up with is a trail of, of telescopes like I did and a trail of other accessories and things that, that was wasted money, needless money that, that I, I could have spent and bought something much nicer later on had I just waited. Um, and I want you to know that you know, you're just starting out and you're you're out there trying, but you're going to automate probably at some time. If you're as serious as you say you are and, and you want to learn this, you're out there with your DSLR and you're trying to look through the rear window at Live View and you're putting your camera on and then you're putting an eyepiece to get Starline and you're thinking, I know I was, that like, this is it. This is astrophotography. This is how it's going to be done. No one ever told me that there was going to be a day where I'd automate. I'd be able to do. I, I never even. It never even occurred to me. Um, so when you're when you're building your plan of where you want to go, I want you to know there's a there's 
much better ways of doing things than what you're doing now. This isn't the end all of what you're doing. So you're going to grow and you're going to learn. And uh, I want you to know now what it is. So when you're making some of those decisions, if I'd have known that there was this automation piece and these other things, some of the decisions that I made back in the day, I, I wouldn't have done. Um, not everybody can do this, uh, but I did. If you can set up two computers, uh, you can even use a, uh, an iPad. I did that for a while until I got this. Uh, this is the screen that was just giving me fits. But what I do is I set up uh, two computers, and then that way I can run a tutorial. Uh, maybe Adam's got something going on where he's showing you how to do a, a processing of a certain target and I can run that tutorial on this computer and then over here on Pixit site I can follow along and I've just found that that has really helped me out uh, not everybody can do that I understand that but uh, if you can even if you just have an iPad or something that you can put to the side to run that tutorial it, it's it's a really great help because uh, you don't have to stop and start on the same computer back and forth just a just a little thought of something you might want to keep in the back of your mind okay buying and selecting gear you can buy new or you can buy used and I got in here that uh, Astro guys are meticulous people they really are um, most of the people I didn't know about used um, when I started I didn't uh, I used to buy used cameras, film cameras back in the day, but I didn't think about it, you know, that there's there's a place to go to get used equipment. And um, because of the way astrophotographers, I find them to be, they take care of their gear. They don't just throw that stuff in a bag without the lens covers and stuff on. Everybody seems to take very good care of their stuff. They treat it like, you know, like, like diamonds. I mean, so getting used equipment, is not a bad idea and you can really save a lot of money doing it. Um, some, I find some parts are better new. Uh, I've bought filters both new and used and the only thing you don't know about filters is you know how did they clean them you know did they, did they use their hands and their fingers did they get fingerprints on them. Filters are expensive and uh, I just like to get a filter that's never been handled by anybody. Um, cameras same thing. Uh, how much time has it been put in? Uh, how much warranty might be left on it? These are high dollar items. So probably your big ticket items. Uh, mounts, I could kind of go either way on a mount. You know, that I've seen some great deals on mounts that, that I probably would have taken it up uh, if I had a good talk with the person ahead of time. Same thing, hours of use, how much uh, weight was put on it? Was it stressed? Has it been sent back to be uh, tuned up or how old is it? Um, and then some resources uh, for used parts. So non-professional, uh, all the people here that have been doing this for six months or more know about Cloudy Nights and Astromart. Those two places have a used uh, classified section. And uh, I have bought a lot of stuff from both of these places. and. Uh, some things it just doesn't make sense to buy it new. You know, you go buy a, you need a new dovetail bracket, you know, and you could go to ADM or Sandy or whatever and spend X amount of dollars and you can probably find it on Cloudy Nights or Astromart for half the price. And I cannot tell you how many times that I was impatient and bought something and then just because I waited to see it, if it showed it did, and I go and buy it new and then not, to, you know, three days later, there it is, used half cost. Um, and then some of the professional people that he's, there's a million of them, you know, there's a bunch of the, the three I just threw down here uh, is High Point, OPT, and I think it's Woodland Hills. Um, Alex mentioned them the other day, and I kind of started looking at them. Astronomics is another good one. Uh, finding ones that are kind of close to you, I found like Astronomics is in, uh, I think, Arkansas or in that area, which is right above my state. So shipping is, you know, like next day for me. So that's always kind of a nice thing. Uh, let's see. Okay, another thing you want to do is you want to create a library, and uh, every go down to the store, the office supply store, get you some binders, get you a three-hole punch and a label maker, or if you have, uh, you know, I use uh, we have a, the blueprint places here around town. 
and it's real cheap. Don't send your files to them to be printed because they'll charge you an arm and a leg to print up a catalog. But if you just print it yourself and then bring it to them, it costs like five, ten bucks to get it bound like these are bound. And so what I do is is I down every time I get a part, you know, that uh, an electrical part or a part that requires, you know, a manual to it, I download the PDF file, I print it, I make a binder, or I make one of these guys here. Um, these are my key manuals. These are the ones that I go to all the time. I may bring them out in the field with me. And uh, so I want them, I don't want to carry binders, so I, I get these little bound deals. But uh, they're very helpful. And I, I go back and forth to the manuals all the time. And as a beginner, I want to tell you something else is that you're going to, you're going to read these manuals. Like I read PhD, you know, when I couldn't figure it out and it didn't make any sense to me reading the manual either because they use terminology and stuff that I'm unfamiliar with. And that's half the battle too, is just learning all the terminology that goes with, with astrophotography. But uh, the more time you go out and you deal with that fear factor and you get out there and you try, and you write down in your ledger the problems that you had and where you ran into things and you go back, the more and more the manuals will start to make sense. You know, I automated about a month and a half ago to SG Pro and I keep going back as I find new little things and I keep getting more and more education out of that manual that I didn't see the last time I was in there. So it's highly recommended to get you a nice library of everything that you've got. It doesn't take that long. Um, and then you want to talk about <clears throat> excuse me, storage for your computer files. This was something else that was a real big deal to me, and I didn't know, once again, what to do. I kept asking questions of people, and I think people just kind of looked at me like I was nuts or something, like, well, it's just like this, you know, and, and I, it didn't make any sense. Uh, I wasn't aware that your program, like, SG Pro, Backyard EOS. I was sort of aware of it, but when you, if you take the time when you go into those programs and fill in, you know, like in SG Pro, you have a key map where you go in and put in all the little initials. And then when you shoot an image, it puts the camera, the temperature, the focus point, uh, the date, how many, how long was the exposure, all that information. Because what's going to happen is, as you're starting out shooting and you start gathering up this data, even though you're in your first week or you're in your second week, believe it or not, within a month or two, you're going to have a hard time finding images, especially when you start stacking them and processing them. You're not going to know. You got. I, I spent weeks trying to figure out a file system. I looked up to see if there were filing systems built for astrophotography or other photography alone that I could use. How is I going to cross match? What am I going to do for next year's files? And, you know, how do I go find? It was just very confusing. And I bought a, uh, a large, you know, external storage drive. You know, I forget how many gigs it is. It's huge. But, uh, you know, and I went and built all these file structures where you got to click through it like 10 times to get down to the image because I wanted to make sure I had every way of finding those files. Well, the reason I'm going through all of this with you right now on this is because when you learn how to use your program that you're using to capture your, your photos with and you learn how to enter the information, in, in, like in Backyard EOS, you can put it in when you, when you set up your target, but you can also enter stuff on the little boxes over there where you image from, where you actually set your exposures. But that data that you put in there will become the headers to your files. So like I said in SG Pro, it, there's so many that you can put it. It solved my problem. So now I can image a whole night. I can image different targets at different times and put them all in the same file. Let them all sit and just run to a one file folder. And in the morning, I can get up and look at them. And I know exactly what everything is because all of that stuff's there. And I didn't know that when I started. So um, like I said, the, I want you to know about things that are coming your way that, that you don't have to worry when you start wondering how this is going to happen or how you're going to get control of this. This exists. This You're going to find out about this, and I want you to know now so that you can plan. So if you have any other questions about filing, I'm, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, 
more resources, books, 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 books are great. Um, I just, these are just three. There's plenty of them. Uh, Long Exposure Astrophotography by Alan Hall is a really, really good book. And it's, it's pretty close to being pretty up to date, Adam. I'm not too sure when it was uh, published, but there's some things in there. He talks about SG Pro and some other things, which is kind of new. Uh, Warren Keller, uh, he did Pix Insight. And uh, this is a, you can get these books uh, from Amazon. You can have them loaded to your Kindle. Um, and even though you don't understand, and, and it's the terminology again, you're, you're just starting out, you know, you don't understand what he's talking about, but just read it because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen is you're going to go out in the field and you're going to do something and something's going to click and you're going to go, Oh, I remember I read about that. Yeah. That's what he was talking about. Okay. I get it. So it's just like anything else. I mean, we've all been to school. We all know what it's like to study. Um, this is one I found not too long ago called The 100 Best Astrophotography Targets by Ruben Keir. Um, I really like that one. There's another one for the SH uh, catalog. It's, uh, uh, I forget the name of the, the atlas. I sent one to Adam the other day. I'll, I'll remember it in a minute. But there's lots of different places that you can get uh, books and, and, and study. Use that as your resources. Right now, you want to educate. You've got to learn how to get all of your programs working. You got to learn how to get your your scope set up. You got to learn how to polar align. You got to learn how to star align. You got to learn how to uh, store your images. You got to learn how to process, and that's a whole other animal. And uh, the most important, probably in the end, and it's it's a very difficult difficult thing. So all these working parts have to come together for you to make that image that you're looking to get. Or as like Alex says, make pretty pictures. Um, let's see. Video tutorials. Video tutorials are wonderful. There's uh, there's a these are three of the sites that I used uh, pretty much exclusively as I was going through. Um, Trevor Jones over at Astro Backyard, he's still uh, doing some things with DSLR. And he's, if you're shooting DSLR right now as a beginner, I would encourage you to check him out. He's, he's got some pretty good videos, and he does a lot of really good explanations on how to, how to use. He's kept his whole, pro, his whole rig very, very simplified. And uh, even though he's been doing it a long time, he's never seen the reason to have to go and buy all this extra stuff. He's got nice stuff, but he, he just keeps it simple. Uh, and he produces beautiful images. Uh, the Astro Imaging Channel, which you're sitting on now, man, this place is a wealth of information. Um, I have uh, gotten more bills on my telephone for data from driving around the country, just streaming, just listening to it in my car. But there's a pretty much, I would say, anything you want to learn about, uh, especially as a beginner right now, you can find they've covered it here in the Astro Imaging Channel. This other one doesn't have the name on it, but it's uh, My Astro Images uh, is the website, but uh, Astro Photography Tutorials is the name of it. It's done by a guy named Doug Hubble. He lives out in California. He's on YouTube. He's got a bunch too, and uh, he has a five, uh, thing, a five video set of beginners from, from the day you want to start thinking about it to what you're going to buy, and he covers each piece of equipment. And that's a place you can go to find what I'm not covering in this one. So um, everything from beginners, everything from processing to guiding, um, because I never found anybody to talk to. A human being, it was three months before I actually got on the phone and actually talked to a human being about this, uh, about astrophotography. Tech support. It's a great place. Uh, you get an actual person to talk to. Uh, the professionals, like I said, I just listed a few over at OPT is Ian, TJ, and Sean. They're real nice guys. They'll help you out. High Point, Isaac, and Vince, and Dave. Uh, Dave uh, is more of the uh, guy in the front that runs it, but Isaac and Vince are your two tech guys. They're both imagers, and uh, they love to help people. And so, um, you want to prepare your questions ahead of time. They get a lot of calls during the day. And uh, the last thing you want to do is get tongue-tied on the phone with them because you can't remember exactly what you're trying to ask. So write your questions down ahead of time and uh, have them ready. 
and so that when you finally do get on the phone with them, you can make the most of that time. Um, and listen, listen to what they're telling you. You know, I know you got a lot to say. You got a lot on your mind. You got all these questions that you're trying to get answered and you're probably trying to jump from one to the next, but take the time. Even if you only get one or two answered and you got 10 to get answered, but you can only get one or two, listen to what they have to say and ask questions, but hit them for everything you can get. Pump them for all the information. That's what I did because talking to a human being about this was just, it was such a novelty. I, I, it never happened for me. Um, I sent mine, guys. I, you know, I live in Louisiana, so we got coffee, pralines, all that kind of stuff down in New Orleans. So, you know, send them a little gift. Throw something their way, man. That way when they see your name on the phone, they'll grab you and, and spend more time with you. I'm not saying to bribe the guys, but, you know, they work. They like getting stuff in the mail. Uh, and thank them for their time. Be humble, you know. They, they get a lot of people that call up, and I'm going to go over some of the people that call and all of that a little bit, but just be nice to them, man. You know that. Forums. Um, forums are – they're they're a big need, but they can be maddening, okay? There's lots of bullies and lots of know-it-alls on the forums. And my advice to you – uh, starting out, you've got a lot of questions. Uh, you're trying to figure out how to make it work. Find a small group if you can, okay? Uh, I don't want to mention anybody straight out, but they're out there. Um, find a group with five, six, seven people that are on there, you know, regularly that you can get to know and, and make friends. I've made friends now all over the world, and I've never even met them face-to-face, -face, but, you know, we're all good friends now, but they'll help you. Some of the bigger forums, um, they're just difficult. You get a lot of different varieties of people and uh, they like to give you uh, oh, and the other thing is, you know, when, when, when you share with somebody on a forum and they post a picture, they post some, give feedback on it. Don't just worry about what you're doing. The whole idea is you're trying to get these guys to get, help you get your, your questions answered. So, you know, try to listen to what they got going on too. Um, See, so where's my next slide? Why didn't it go? Okay, let me back up one. Okay, there we go. Sorry. All right, the wall. You know, I call it the wall because the wall is is that you're out there, you're trying, you're imaging, and you're not. You got you just don't know who to ask. And when you finally get on a forum, you gotta be careful about what you do when you ask questions on forums. You want to keep them short. You want to keep them to the point. You want to give them enough to understand, but you don't want to overdo it, okay, because they'll go off on tangents. Someone will take a little piece of what you got to say in your, in your question, and then your whole post will go off in a different direction, and you will never get your question answered. And then you got other guys, like you ask him what time it is, and he'll tell you the inner workings of the atomic clock, and all I want to know is what time it is. You know, so you got to learn to sift through the bad and the good. You're going to get some people that tell you, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You're doing it all wrong. You need to do it this way. Just, just either block them or ignore them, okay? Um, there's a lot of good people out there that really do remember what it's like of what you're going through right now. And, and, and lastly, just never give up, you know. And uh, like I said at the beginning, there's, there's no set rule to do all of this, but if, if you got all these questions and you, you, you write them down, you, you use the forums, call your tech support people, read the manuals, get into your books. Um, I'm sure Adam, the rest of them all have the same story. You'll, it, it'll come along and um, you'll get better and better. And, and then the fun of learning and making mistakes, you know, people said, oh, I love the learning curve of all that. I didn't like it. I didn't, you know, and I'm, I'm still at the beginning of the learning curve, but the learning curve of just being able to hook my stuff up and turn it on, I didn't like that part, but I like the part now that I got it running and now I'm screwing it up all the time, but at least I'm learning now why and understanding that that's fun and there's nothing wrong with that, but don't give up. Just keep at it. And uh, like I said, I know that this presentation was pretty much kind of an opinion, um, but you know, it, that's uh that's how I did it and you know I'm four to six months in and uh you know I, I'm getting 20 minute exposures now round stars I'm getting decent data I still can't process 
very well. Um, I get help with that too. But you can do it. You can. You don't have to spend two, three, four years to get to the point where you can actually get some data going. And and the other thing to just back up is on the on the spending the money and being careful what you buy. Um, if you if you're careful with all of that, then then you're gonna save a lot more money for stuff that you really do need down the line. And by and large, that's about it, uh, Adam. Uh, that's uh that's how I went. That's what went on with me. So hopefully that there's something in there that might give somebody else a hand. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, I basically agree with a lot of the stuff you said. Um, you can make this hobby really difficult and really painful, or you could try and ask questions and uh, anticipate issues. Um, you know, none of us like the frustration, but I think a lot of us like the challenge. And as long as it's uh, fun to do, and as long as you're having fun, I think you're doing it right. I still, uh, being on the channel, I've seen a lot of people come through here where uh, some people are naturals and just, they've been doing it for six months and their images are amazing. And uh, I put myself on the other side of that. I feel like I really took a long time to get to where I was, but uh, at least I was enjoying it the whole time. Um, but it's interesting that you see both types of people. I don't think there's one perfect upgrade. No, path. no, there's not. The biggest thing I guess to glean out of any of it is just the, the decision making process. I find that if you make that goal of where you want to be and you, you weigh what you're going to buy against what you, where you want to be so that you can try to save that money. I, I wasted a lot of money that I didn't need to do. And, and, you know, I ended up recouping most of it, but you don't have to do that. You know, stay focused on where you want to go. And then if you don't know, just wait, wait, ask questions. People will tell you, watch these forums, watch these tutorials. Yep. Yeah, one of the interesting things where uh, I guess our human instinct comes into play is uh, with New Gear and uh, that desire to always, uh, as, as Alex says, be a gearhead or always want to have, well, always want to buy the latest and greatest. And as <clears throat> interested as I am in the new gear that comes out, uh, and I really like seeing what the manufacturers are doing, that's more the gearhead in me. Uh, I'm less reluctant to buy new gear when I have a working system that's really working for me. Uh, too many times I've bought one new piece that gave me six months of headaches. Uh, oh, do you, do you mind if I say something about that too? Go ahead. Uh, the uh, one, uh, one last thing to add in, you just reminded me, I forgot to say it, is, is when you're out there struggling with this stuff, try, to, try not to add two or three things at one time. If you're going to make a change to something, do one at a time, get it up and running, get it working, because if you try to add more than one, you're not going to know where your errors might be coming from, and then you're just going to waste a lot of time pulling your hair out trying to figure out. So even even for the old guys, I'm sure, was they add stuff, they do it one at a time. I, I think I've heard you even mention that before. Yeah, absolutely. A good rule to follow, particularly with um, uh, hardware when you're uh, hooking it up to the USB because sometimes just the order of the ports you plug in uh, are water causing issues for you. So the fact that you could plug it in one at a time and say, okay, it's working, it's working, it's working. Time to plug this one in, it's work, it's working. Uh, use it for an evening and then move on. Um, yeah, something else I mentioned the last time we talked is that uh, Windows does not like you to be moving USB ports around. It has to relearn it every time. So if you get a label maker and mark what you're hooking stuff up to, you'll have a, not, a much easier time out in the field because sooner or later, Windows won't, the device just won't work because Windows has to keep relearning it. And we all know what happens. That Windows just gets confused after a while. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, we've had lots of uh, viewers uh, this evening. So it looks like a popular topic. This is always one of my favorite topics because <clears throat> as, as terrible as it sounds, <clears throat> sometimes it's better to tell beginners what they should avoid rather than what they should do because um, you can do it properly a hundred different ways. Right. But, uh, a lot of us have screwed it up in one, particular we, in one particular way that we know to suggest other people avoid it. Um, and 
leave a, a trail of uh, useless gear in the in the wake. Yeah, you'll win a lot more people over when you tell them about your mistakes than rather than telling them what they should do. Yeah. Yep. All right. So uh, again, thank you, Sean. Um, next week's session uh, is another uh, making of an image session for us, uh, Eric. Uh, for uh, I'm forgetting the target, uh, and it's. Uh, let me think about that. Eric, what's the target for next week? Uh, the Cave Nebula. We're going cave to do Nebula. There we go. Hubble Pilot and then a, a Hydrogen RGB. Okay, so Eric's going to take us on a walkthrough of his processing for his APOD winning Cave Nebula. So it's uh, really cool to be able to uh, basically see what went into a world-class image. Um, if you ever get your hands on data that good, uh, you kind of see uh, what you could do. And Cave, Cave Nebula is a great example because uh, it's a tough target, very difficult target for, for a number of different reasons. I'll probably bring them all up next week because uh, it's a target that I've struggled with. So I'll, I'll say that before uh, uh, and not uh, break out my frustrations. Uh, which might be more appropriate for today's session, but it, yeah, that's a target that's frustrated me a lot, I should say. But I guess it's good if the target's frustrating you and not your gear. Because <laughs> it, like, it was the data that frustrated me, not necessarily my gear. Possibly my skies. Um, all right, on a, on a long uh, side note. Um, Sorry, just reading some comments on the side. But uh, again, I do want to thank you all for coming. Like I said, next week, uh, APOD image processing by Eric. And uh, we have some other stuff uh, uh, scheduled for the end of July on the Kate experiment, C-A-T-E, uh, which is basically tracking the solar eclipse um, with, I think, I want to say two or 3,000 different locations, all using the same equipment. A really cool experiment that's going to get a continuous view of the eclipse for uh, what uh, a few hours, I guess. Um, so we hear a little bit about that in the end of July. Uh, otherwise, that's all I've got for you tonight. Uh, one more time, I'm going to thank Sean. Uh, we do. Uh, we've had a few people step up in the last few weeks, but as always, we're always looking for people to come on and and talk about something. Um, if you have a unique uh, topic or a um, basically something you kind of think you have some expertise in and we'd love to have you on. Uh, you can always contact me off-site um, via the contact page on the website, theastroimagingchannel.com. That's it. See you guys all next week.